Welcome back to Nightmine, friends, and welcome, for the first time, to our new residence. I'd like to thank you all immensely for bearing with me over the past, say, month and a half while the work was put in to make this place a reality. I never feel good about taking time away from regular upload patterns to do anything, because I always want to be a consistent presence in your lives. But I knew at the beginning of the year that it was time our community had a proper gathering place. And so, after taking the time to become a self-taught carpenter, interior designer, electrician, and one monster moving crew, I was able to put together the very first Nightmind office. A perfect place for conducting our new investigations. Oh, I also learned how to break into buildings, but let's not talk about that too much. Some very celebrated old mansions in New England are itching to find out who broke in and stole their wallpaper. Here, you'll see of course we have our internet access and technology workstation, as well as our document storage, resource materials, and a few odds and ends. You might recognize something on my bookshelf from a very specific time of the year that will be coming up again quite soon. On our right side, we have my new, and by new I mean very old and very fragile, projector screen, as well as some wall-mounted file cabinets. This is where we're going to be conducting our work for any and all case file investigations from now on unless a case somehow involves a visit to the Dark Arcade. But wait, if only one wall in this room is dedicated to case files, how about the others? Don't worry, I made sure to utilize the space provided here to suit our needs in the event of sudden happenings and ongoing investigations. On our left, we have the new space for Cat's Eye, with a few mementos of prior Nightmind topics pinned to the sideboards to remind us of lessons learned. And who am I kidding? It's also fun to look at old memories, right? Mugshots are my favorite kind of portrait. As for the back wall... <laughs> well, that is a little something special we'll get to later. Right now we have business to attend to. I've kept you all waiting long enough to return to our normal activity. It's been entirely too long since we've opened up one of our case files. And to serve as an appropriate ribbon-cutting ceremony for our new gathering space, I decided to pull out the oldest story I currently have on record after the Wyoming incident. In November of 2006, YouTube had reached a point of peak popularity online. In just a year and a half of operation, the website had already pulled enough viewership to gain the attention of Google. YouTube's owners were approached by Google in October of 2006 to negotiate a purchase, which was finalized on November 13th to the price of about $1.65 billion. The YouTube we know of today had just begun, and that's why I find it very satisfying that YouTube's first full interactive horror web series, The Human Pet, began just four days later. He is here against his will, a video title that grabs you immediately, with the image of a man tied up gagged and laying on a bare mattress in an empty room. It was, again, November of 2006. YouTube was brand new. The concept of alternate rounding games and immersive online storytelling was brand new. Nine Inch Nails Year Zero game hadn't even begun yet. The Dateline NBC segment, To Catch a Predator, had been running for two years, informing viewers nationwide that the internet was far more dangerous, lawless, and capable of real atrocities than they ever expected. With only a few days of Google ownership before the advent of automated content tracking and less than two years of operation under its name, YouTube really could have been hosting anything at all on the site and had no idea. It was very possible that the horror depicted in certain videos could be horribly, appallingly real. A man in a mask holding another person captive in front of an audience online. Could it be legitimate? Crazier things had already happened. Thankfully, alternate round of game detectives back in the day who knew signs of a fictional experience had a foothold to support the assertion that the video was the start of a series. For most of the runtime, there is no audio. But just as the mass kidnapper looks into the camera and video distortion occurs, we catch a message. I think by now most of you will pick up on the sound of audio that's been played in reverse. This trick is even easier than binary code. One trip to any number of programs lets us decipher what's being said. actual serial killer or web series creator. I'd say any form of vague, threatening message that's been obscured by reverse playback or a form of code usually gives the game away. Nobody out there actually thinks that they can top the Zodiac Killer. And as you'll see, there's plenty more evidence of it being fiction where that came from. On the same day in 2006, the next upload appeared. You will see everything. A message declaring pretty clearly that the kidnapper isn't just showing off a prize. 
He's putting on a show for us, including teasers of the action to come. And now, rounding out the uploads for November 17th, 2006, we receive the third promise of the series. Viewer involvement. My pet needs to eat. Help him. The pet looks into the camera and asks if he can have something to eat, begging for food while the kidnapper enjoys his dinner. The pet speaks to him out loud in the room, asking whether his kidnapper wants revenge, or money, or if he has a need to do this. If he's crazy, he can get help for him. He'll get him pills. His family will give him money. Anything he wants. He just wants to eat. And he wants to leave. The kidnapper presents us with a message. I will give my pet only one solid food from now on. There is only one solid food that provides all the vitamins and minerals a human needs to survive. Get it right, and he lives. And just like that, online viewers became players in a game of life or death. Early responders had a challenge to complete. Give the kidnapper the right answer to keep the pet fed on a diet that wouldn't slowly kill him, and do it before somebody else gave the wrong answer. But how would this work? YouTube comments? No, it seemed there was a different outlet for interacting with the kidnapper, listed in the About section for the channel, along with information that sheds a bit of light on the situation. My name is unimportant. I am an artist. I will never be caught, but what I have done here will live forever. For several months now, I've been uploading videos of my human pet. His name is Eric. He is being held against his will. That is all you need to know about him for now. Eric would very much like to leave his prison cell and go home to his family, but that is not up to me. It is up to you. You will decide whether Eric gets to see his family again. You will decide whether Eric lives or dies. This is my masterpiece and you will play by my rules. Codemaster P.S. Art is a mystery to be unraveled. A link is provided to a blogspot page for the human pet, where Codemaster goes by another name, Sam Deercott, which is just an anagram for Codemaster. Now, something might be bugging you regarding the information we just went over through the About section. Sam Deercott mentioned that he's been uploading for several months now, but the videos began on November 17th, right? Here's the issue. We don't know the exact timeline for every action involved in the human pet. It's unknown when the information in the About tab on YouTube was posted, and we don't really know at which point traction in the series began, because that bit I mentioned earlier about YouTube viewers not being able to figure out whether this was real or fake in 2006 really did hinder the project. According to an article on the human pet giving a heads up to alternate reality game fans on November 8th, 2006, some of the links to the game have changed. The videos we can see now appeared on the 17th, but this article went up on the 8th, and it seems from the writing that the videos had already been going up for a while by the time it was covered in 2006. What happened exactly? For that, we can take a look at the comments section on the article. On November 12th, Sierra Polar Bear wrote, Sam Deercott posted this on his blog profile today. YouTube deleted my account. It looks like censorship is alive and well in America. Please be patient. I'm looking for another option. Sam Deerka had been posting before November 17th, and some viewers blew the whistle, suspecting he was legitimate. As such, he was deleted, causing a re-upload attempt that, thankfully, worked out and made it possible for us to conduct this investigation at all. We can also use the blog where he made that post to our advantage in fixing the timeline, too. It seems that Sam was using the blog as his primary portal for record-keeping and spreading the videos outside of YouTube. Activity for the human pet actually began on October 4th, 2006, with the announcement that all evil things must come to a beginning. The following posts appeared to be the first video uploads embedded to the blog. Apparently, we're missing the very first video, but Sam picked up his re-uploads with He is here against his will, and you will see everything on October 12th and 14th. The following uploads occurred almost weekly, and it is satisfying to see major activity took place around Halloween, when viewers were issued the first challenge of making sure that Eric survives. We also do have an extended blog post from Sam Deercon talking about the channel deletion to confirm what happened. He got back up and running immediately with the version of the channel that's still around today and kept uploading. In July of 2008, over a year and a half later. What happened? Why is there such a major drop in upload activity? If we check out the blog updates from December of 2006 and beyond, we can see posts for every video that appears on the current channel, all taking place in relatively quick succession. However, the video links, which do show up now, appear to all be unavailable. Either YouTube attacked the human pet again, or the videos have been set to private. My guess is that Sam Deercott had way too many issues with people taking the web series on face value. Viewers must have believed in its reality too strongly despite it being fiction, and because of that, Sam decided to edit the branding for the show at the beginning of previous uploads, then re-upload them. His video header doesn't exist for the first few uploads, but you can find it on all the rest, along with some content warnings. 
Every video description also includes the tagline, an interactive fictional horror story directed by Sam Deercott. That's the best guess I can offer for why Sam went through the entire run of videos at his first pacing in 2006 and 2007 and then set them to private. He needed to edit the videos with enough obvious tags about it being a web series that he could get away with uploading them, and then did so in 2008. I guess it stands as a testament to how far we've come along in being able to upload our storytelling without too much worry, even though we still have challenges other types of channels don't necessarily face. Sam was forced to rebrand his art, but thankfully, the art itself remains. So now that we fixed the timeline, let's get back into the story and see what happened with Eric, the human pet. As stated earlier, uploads on the existing channel began again in 2008, on July 25th, starting with a video titled, The Answer. Sam is seen approaching an altar with his mask nearby, where he kneels to pray as clips play of Eric waking up in his room. He discovers a bag of cat food has been delivered, and we see clips of Sam filming a black cat. The illusion here is obvious. The human pet is still a pet, so he gets to eat pet food. We're also given a clip that catches Eric going for a run, unaware he's being filmed. Sam is teasing us about the content of his next video, Stalking. Most of Sam Deercott's videos feature orchestral music and choir singing, and all of it is very recognizable, as is the case with this upload in which he plays the very dramatic piece, O Fortuna. We see him following Eric as he goes for a run each night, with music climbing throughout the buildup of the song. Sam doesn't wait long to catch his new pet. He comes around just enough times to confirm the route Eric is going to take, then hides in the trees and strikes as his victim passes, just in time for the dramatic tension in O Fortuna to explode. The action cuts to clips of someone uncovering a woman's body buried in the woods, and then, at the climax of O Fortuna, a line of mugshots with dates and letters attached, ending with Eric and unfolding to reveal a full wall. Sam Deercott's resume. He's been stalking, kidnapping, and killing people since August of 1989. Eric is victim number 24. His story is only the first to go up online in Sam Deercott's career. It shouldn't surprise us really that Deercott has been doing this for so long, but the way it's presented, the impact lands much harder than expected. There's such a way of delivering this reveal that it creates goosebumps and makes your blood run a good deal colder. We're not dealing with a first offender here. This is a truly lethal, incredibly sick person, and they've been very successful in perfecting their methods over a period of 17 years. We're not entirely hopeless in this situation, though Sam's resume is intimidating enough to worry that we'll never free Eric. The next video, My Pet Needs Your Help to Survive, issues the next challenge for viewers who want to save Sam's captive. Again, Dear Cop plays intense orchestral music that swells in power as he leads us to the next dehumanizing condition for his pet to endure. In one week, he's going to give Eric only filthy pond water to drink. The audience must decide how he's going to filter and purify the water, and they can choose only one common household item. The bar has been raised. Eric may have been able to survive on one type of solid food if the audience had gotten it wrong for a while before dying of malnutrition, but if he fails to clean the water, he'll suffer the effects within hours and die so much faster. As viewers waited for the results of their voting, Sam presented news from the world outside Eric's cage. His father, Michael Taylor, set up a website to find Eric and films himself asking for help in the search for his son. He's also aware of the YouTube channel, The Human Pet, and knows they need to work with the rules set up by Sam Deercon if they want Eric to live. This doesn't prevent him from asking Sam directly to stop the game and release his son. Sam, naturally, will not comply. He moves ahead with the next video, A Human Life in Your Hands, in which Eric is given his first delivery of pond water. He doesn't know what to do with it, but can't drink it. Eric despairs on the bed until Sam lets us know that it's time to see the effects of the audience input. Now, Eric lives or dies, based on your decision. We've had a sense of Sam Deercott's attitude about this whole affair right along, but now get to see just how much of a joke he's willing to make this next as he shows up in a Santa outfit and a gift while the Carol of the Bells plays. He leaves Eric with the present which, unwrapped, reveals a bottle of bleach. The audience member who won the decision for this gift was allowed to leave Eric a message, providing instructions for him on how to use the bleach. He follows the instructions, taking off his shirt to use as a filter so he can remove solid items from the pond water. Then it's up to him to guess just how much bleach he's putting in the water and how long he's letting it sit. He has no watch, no way to count the time. This is educated guesswork at best, and if he dies now, it may be his own fault. But it seems the gift paid off. Eric isn't shown to be dead or suffering at the end, and there aren't any messages of the audience's failure to save him. Instead, we have Eric looking at the camera and asking, Why are you torturing me like this? We're shown footage of Sam breaking into Eric's home and going to the kitchen at night, 
followed by a surveillance video of Eric walking to the fridge on the phone. He tells someone, relax, nobody knows about this. Sam delivers the final word in this video. I know. There is indeed a reason that Eric is here. His suffering does not appear to be the result of random chance. Sam has a secret he wants to tell us. And bit by bit, through new channels set up by Sam to deliver the videos, we do find out. It's unclear how the following videos originally made it to the audience during the active run of the series. I can't find evidence of distribution on Sam Deercon's blog, so I can only assume he provided links to lucky commenters he got in contact with, or used the old video response system that YouTube used to have. It's just lucky that they can be found on YouTube at all through associated videos. Eric's face is so clearly centered in the video thumbnails that you can't miss it when they appear in the sidebar. Sam Deercott claims this is just one of many interesting things found on Eric's computer, so we're given proper context for what we're about to see. In total, there are seven videos recorded for the benefit of somebody Eric knows, and as he talks, we get to know his story and gain a sense of why Sam might be keeping him captive. We don't need to watch the entirety of these vlogs, just the relevant portions. I'll go ahead and provide a run-through for you all now. Today is February 2nd. 2006. My day consisted of filing, getting coffee for someone, filing some more, photocopying, stocking office supplies, and then using basic math, math that I studied in third grade. And the thing is, I'm not out here for any of that, but the auditions are not really going anywhere right now. I have just about no friends out here. And the friends I do have, I feel like, are trying to use me for something. Because that's the theme with everybody out here. And since I have very little to offer, I imagine these friendships are not going to last too long. My parents aren't talking to me. My dad hasn't called me back in about two weeks. Um, he's mad at me, of course, because I'm out here pursuing my dreams. Uh, my mom hasn't talked to me either because she has what my dad says, so. And it's, uh, it can be kind of lonely, gotta be honest with you. I've been reading a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, and, um, that's me now. I'm going to stay positive because I know that I'm out here for a reason. I'm pursuing my dream. And I'm going to look back on this in like a year or two and I'm going to laugh about it because it's going to be funny. Because I know this business is all about perseverance and there's nobody more persistent than me. Today is March 29th. 2006 and I am in a very good mood today so you remember how I was talking about that audition for that independent horror film that I found on Craigslist and I've been going to the callbacks and blah 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 well I got the part yes I know I'm smiling all right let's see let me break it down for you so I had to go in um I have a really small part like that big but um, it's cool because it's my first, you know, actual speaking role in a film that's going to get distributed and shown at possibly a film festival. This director, he's apparently done some other independent work. He's very mysterious. In fact, I've never even met the guy, which is um, really weird. I met a couple of his assistant directors, and um, they were really nice. And, you know, I get to play a victim, so I get... <laughs> which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm excited about it. Today is April 15th, 2006. And this marks my second week now of being on set rehearsing for this independent horror film and I have to be honest with you I love it this is exactly 
what I wanted to do. And um, I just love everything about it. I love being on set. I love the cameras on me. I love rehearsing the lines. I love having the crew around. Like the whole atmosphere. It's just, I mean, this is what I came out here to do. And I'm finally doing what I've wanted to do. Oh, and today, even though I still haven't met this director, his wife showed up on set. I guess she has some free time or something. But this woman is freaking gorgeous. I mean, like a perfect 10. And so, of course, I started talking to her and um, we had a nice conversation. And she says that she's looking for a babysitter for her son. And I told a little lie, like about that big. And I said, yeah, I've done babysitting before. I've had a little babysitting experience back in Chicago. And, you know, I love kids. But anyway, I start next Saturday. She said, okay. So I'll get to go over to her house. I'll probably get to meet this director, since he can't really avoid me if I'm at his house. I'll make a little extra cash. And the best part is I'll get to see his gorgeous wife. Her name was Sue. She said, call me Sue. I said, call me Eric. Um, anyway, I'll get to see her. And yeah, not too bad for a day's work. Wish I could say that I've been enjoying the last few days, but I can't say that. August 26, 2006. And um, today I had uh, my second interrogation, and this whole thing has been like a nightmare that I can't wake up from, even though I keep trying to. Sue's just been a wreck. I've been wrecked. And, I don't know, she doesn't even want to talk anymore. And she put this wall up. It's just been a very difficult couple of days. You know, we had the, uh, the funeral just a couple of days ago. And that was, that was pretty rough. But there's still no word back on anything, so... I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just trying to be there for him. You know. Today is September 28th, 2006. And today I called Sue again. And she didn't get back to me. All I can think about is her. I feel like I'm just completely empty inside right now. I just, um, I've just been really depressed the last couple of days. And I haven't really left my room. I kind of feel like she blames me for what happened. Even though she would never admit it. I'm not a person who gives up on things. And I'm not going to give up on her. Today is October 10th. 2006, today is the day I take action. My hand has been forced, and so today I act. And then after that, maybe after that I have to go away for a while. I don't know. Can't wait any longer. I'm nervous. But I know what I have to do. After today, everything will be different. 
What you didn't see from these vlogs is the major portion of something I'm sure most of you already picked up on that's very powerful. Eric's humanity. If you'll allow me to stop the run for just a moment to marvel at the machinery that makes it run, I'd like to point out that the human pet did something that's difficult to get right and is highly admirable for any form of storytelling. Each new addition generates more intrigue and overall emotional investment. We're being hooked on mental and emotional levels through the inclusion of these personal vlogs by Eric, seeing who he is as a person, getting to know him at his most unguarded, coming to like him and understand the situation he was in before he was captured. We also get to see some of what he was wrapped up in that may have led to him being targeted by Sam Vercott. I think you can all read between the lines for what Eric had going on, but in case you didn't catch it all, let's recap quickly. Eric Taylor is a young man who moved to Los Angeles to pursue his dream of being an actor. He's been working temporary jobs like most pursuing actors while trying to pick up auditions and get roles. He did manage to get one too on the set of an independent horror movie run by a mysterious director. Someone that nobody ever really meets. You know who Eric did manage to meet though? The director's beautiful wife, who seemed like she didn't get to see much of her husband either and invited a younger, more approachable male presence to come around and babysit for her. It's very clear what happened as a result. See when Eric got together behind the director's back and somewhere along the line of the affair, things fell apart. Somebody died, Sue was emotionally crippled, and Eric can no longer get in touch with her. He's also been interrogated twice in regards to the event that threw Sue's world into a tailspin, but whatever happened left Eric with a need to act on her behalf, even if that meant going away for a while. And then he was captured by Sam Deercott, who made it clear he knew what Eric had done or was planning to do. So we have an affair, and we have the darkest implication for what can happen involving an affair. Murder. Maybe the funeral was for the director. Maybe the funeral was for the son Eric was apparently supposed to babysit. After all, Eric says he believes Sue blames him for what happened. But no matter who's dead, Eric still feels a need to do something that's going to be, quite possibly, morally and legally wrong. Secret, secret, secrets. Sam Deercott knows how to tease us well. And of course, Sam knows that too, which is why he just keeps on rolling with his next upload, Still Life and Death, featuring some video editing feats you would have seldom seen in 2007. We begin with Sam presenting an apple on the table and a note that changes throughout the video to convey new messages, starting with a reply to Michael Taylor, Eric's father. Sam cannot honor Michael's request to release Eric. He is an artist. An artist, he reminds us, with a long career and he will not compromise his artistic integrity. He will not sell out either. He has a story that must be told involving Eric, involving his viewers, involving love, death, and betrayal. And here we see a woman seated on a couch with Eric in a dark room. Sam tells Michael that if he wants to see his son alive again, he must call off the investigation and play along. The only way this can end well for Eric is his way. Viewers too must follow Sam's ways. All actions have consequences, including the audiences. It's then that Sam decides to demonstrate some of his skill as an artist in the literal sense, using paper craft to show off a time-lapse animation. A seed planted spreads its roots and then grows tall and lush, eventually bearing fruit, and bringing a man, a woman, and a snake beneath it. Sam Deercott leaves us with a message, a code and a Bible reference relating to the book of John. The passage 832 reads, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. As for what the code itself says, it means at the right time, and this was only solved when a user on the Unfiction Forums thread ran it through a monoalphabetic substitution solver dozens of times. A lot of the codes have been solved using what's known as a rotation cipher to the 13th degree. Others have been solved using backwards alphabet matchups. Some of them have involved more complex methods. But it all boils down to what has so far been the leading result of coded messages in almost every web series ever. Cryptic statements that either promise to reveal secrets in the future, leads to external characters or websites that would show up later on their own anyway to further the plot, or messages of doom to enhance the scare factor. I'm afraid that as good as the human pet is, this web series does not break the pattern of using codes as a gimmick. There is nothing hidden in any of these codes that isn't revealed to us later or seem to be planned for an eventual reveal. So much of the coded messages tell us things we already know, suspect, or find out within two videos, or is just some kind of statement about Sam's entire idea about the situation and his power and... It's exactly what you suspect of this kind of thing. But, on the same note, Sam is doing exactly what should be done for a web series of this nature. Locking crucial information behind an arbitrary code when the main plotline is being told in linear visual storytelling is a misstep, and the human pet is making sure to avoid it. We might be a little bit sick of the code gimmick today, but I will admit that in 2006 and 2007, it was definitely new enough to be cool and get people interested. 
Now it's easy to see that all the code breaking done during the game's live run resulted in... nothing really. My point is, don't worry about missing out on any of these codes. I've looked at the results of all the code breaking myself, and there's nothing in them that gets in the way of continuing this story by not finding out what they meant. Anything they have to tell you, we get anyway, through videos. So, speaking of continuing this story through videos, let's see where Sam picked up from the art display he made for us all those years ago. It seems he went on a bit of a creativity streak while Eric languished in captivity. Sam decided to take a video from the fine Eric Taylor YouTube channel where family members were uploading pleas for his release and remix it, adding his own fun spin to something he must have felt was very boring. This is definitely more of the hateful prankster attitude we saw when he put on the Santa outfit, showing how much he's actually enjoying what he's doing. But Sam is, to a degree, a fair sort of serial killer, providing viewers with a chance to engage as an audience after having his fun. Viewers would be allowed to ask Eric three questions, which he would have to answer. The next two videos on the channel appear to be uploaded out of order. The sequence shows, YouTube sins confessed, followed by ghosts caught on tape, but it's the second video in which Sam requests that viewers call him on a number supply through a code to confess their sins. Before doing that, however, he shows us just how deeply he was stalking Eric before capturing his human pet. Sam had installed cameras in every room of Eric's apartment, and a shot of the living room reveals this is where we saw a man and woman together in dark lighting. We can assume this to have been Eric and Sue, as we hear Eric leave a voicemail for her while seated on the couch. We also have shots of Eric at his computer desk, which looks a lot like the surface that Sam used for his video, Still Life and Death, as well as the picture frames on that desk. It's made easier to assume that Sam has been using Eric's stuff when we see him enter after Eric leaves for his nightly run. Room by room, he takes down the cameras, ready to collect the footage and prepare for the capture of his victim. It's after this that viewers receive Sam's message to confess their sins in exchange for his own. In the following video, choir music plays over religious imagery as Sam allows voicemails from sinning audience members to be heard. Confessions range from coveting thy neighbor's goods to having an affair, assisting in an affair, and even committing incest. Most of the confessions, in fact, have to do with an affair. Sam is clearly highlighting a theme. At the end of the video, we see a field of fresh grace with Sam's message, God forgive me, for I have sinned. Further affirmation of his long history of murder. The next video to appear is titled, Kimberly Miller Bears All, in which Kim, the older sister of Eric, fights the viewpoint being expressed by Sam in his videos. To her, Eric is not a willing participant in breaking up a marriage, but somebody who witnessed the modern reproduction of a broken home situation that he himself grew up in, with a depressed mother spiraling into alcoholism and an abusive, absent father figure. Being a kind-hearted and empathetic person deeply affected by such a scene, Eric, Kimberly explains, would have felt deep emotional needs to be involved, and most likely got caught up in Sue's desires to feel loved again. This video originally comes from the Fine Eric Taylor YouTube channel, like the videos before it did in which Sam Deercop mocked family members of Eric's. Once again, he takes the opportunity to edit the video for his own purposes, inserting surveillance footage that reveals Sam wasn't just recording Eric, he was recording Sue as well, catching both of them having the affair in Eric's apartment and Sue's home. And to top it all off, really driving the knife deep into Kim's testimony, Sam presents us with footage of Eric digging in a field at night. Presumably, he was just finishing up taking care of whatever action he felt it was time to take during his final vlog, or whatever caused the funeral that took place much earlier. The next video is a bit of an odd one, but easily explained in the aftermath of study by viewers at the time. It's a re-upload by Sam Deercott of another man's video, Tom D. Caesar claiming not to listen to him because he spreads lies and had been attempting to mislead his viewers. The video recounts the events of the character Tom D. Caesar interfering with the human pet game off of YouTube, working with viewers on the unfiction forums to catch Sam and trying to prevent them from putting the life of one of their own in danger. He goes on about how he needs to be trusted more by viewers because he used to be in a worldwide secret organization with Sam and is the only one who knows his tricks and therefore the only one who can outsmart him and save Eric. Does this sound like a terrible plot twist to you from this stalk, catch, keep, and murder serial killer story? I'm not surprised, and you should trust that feeling. Viewers put together quickly that Tom D. Caesar was just an anagram for a Sam Deercott, which is again an anagram for a Codemaster. And Sam would never put up a video like this to provide exposure to an enemy that knew his secrets if he actually did have an enemy. This was surmised to be yet another one of Sam's hateful prankster moments, this time in the form of a long con. He drew players in early, play them all the way through, and then gave the hint in this video that if they kept following Tom D. Caesar, they'd find only misery, because there was no Tom D. Caesar, only Sam Deercott. The next couple of videos give us what we've all really been after, in a way. 
Mommy's affair caught on hidden camera is exactly what it sounds like, showing footage of Eric and Sue's romance intercut with old home videos shot by the director with his previously faithful wife. There are even moments of voicemails left by Eric begging for Sue to talk to him playing over clips of her emotional decline, all accompanied by a sad, piano-heavy song. In the end, we have a long, very well-shot zoom-out sequence through photo frames of tableaus created by Sam, punctuating moments of history between Eric and Sue. And then, completing the saga of Eric, we have the upload, Dirty Secrets Revealed. Our human pet, having suffered for so long in captivity, is forced on camera by Sam to show off his long, overgrown hair and beard, and then spill his guts to those whose questions were accepted by the Codemaster. Longtime followers of the human pet got their chance to speak to Eric here in video form, prompting him to confess what he was able. Eric provided details of his relationship with Sue and her failing marriage, doing his best to skirt the issue of his part in helping it dissolve at the end. One interesting bit of information comes to light at the end when Eric says he tried to help her, but she made it so that no one could help her. All of this is said as a clip of a bloody shirt is thrown into a hall. Here we have our first hint that Sue, and not Eric, may have been responsible for the death of the director. Eric might have just helped her cover it up. Had Eric actually been planning to confess to the crime at the end of his vlogs? Was this the reason he felt he was going to go away for a while? It's very possible. The second question asked of Eric deals with Sue's son, Russell. What Kim told us about Eric's nature and his past seemed to ring true here, as Eric is obviously moved while recounting the decline of Russell's emotional well-being during his parents' impending divorce. The third question brings up the issue of Eric's father, Michael, claiming that contact with him was sporadic over the last few months before his kidnapping. Eric explains that it was just a chaotic time, with the sudden movement from working terrible part-time jobs to suddenly being cast in a film, and then of course, his involvement with Sue. It's during a montage of all these moments that another secret is revealed that sheds light on the conflicts in the narrative. Not from Eric, but from Sam Deercott. Remember the cameras installed in Sue's house? Well, she found one. One of many. So many cameras, in fact, that one even found its way catching a dinner meeting between Sue and Eric from a table behind them. Sam Deercott was there for the entire event. The whole sordid history, from beginning to end, caught on film, and he was there to take the footage. And somewhere along the line, Sue found out. She discovered she was being spied on, and there was only one thing she could have been doing that someone would want to catch her involved in. This explains a line expressed by Sue in a conversation with Eric caught on tape. You don't realize how bad this situation has become. I don't feel safe with my son in our house. Somebody who catches their spouse cheating with undeniable video proof and then files for divorce on claims the cheater is the only one who broke a vow wins in court very easily, and a director with prestige, money, and influence would want to protect everything that was his when the marriage began and throughout its duration. That director had everything to gain by filing for divorce with proof that Sue cheated, in their own home no less. Sue, however, had everything to lose especially custody of her son, as video evidence of her drinking and cheating could paint her as a mother unfit to be the primary caregiver. She was immediately forced into a corner, and she knew it. The moment she spotted that camera, Sue knew how badly she'd been caught and what it meant. She was caught. Eric was caught. And if she wanted to stop this before everything broke down, there was only one way to do it. Only one way to defeat a man who was so heavily armed against her and ready to go to court. And who else would help her pull off the ultimate solution besides her lover, who helped create the situation in the first place? Of course Eric would help cover up the murder. He would do anything for her, wouldn't he? Especially when he saw the shadow of his own abusive and absentee father and the director and his poor, poor mother and Sue. Kim's testimony was meant to help, but Sam Deercott knew exactly how much it would seal Eric's fate once he showed us what Sue's part in this was. At the end of the video, we're told by Sam that if we want to know the rest of what happened, we would need to join his story. And it's at this point that things begin to get simultaneously even better and worse. On July 26, 2008, Sam uploads what he refers to as the start of Phase 2. Apparently, we now get to explore the depths of his resume, as shown off so much earlier in the timeline. All those pictures on the wall, all those mugshots, Sam has evidence to show us from each and every victim. And now he's going to give us a free space on clearing the board. His last job, just before finding Eric Taylor. Driving around the city at night, Sam comes across a woman on a sidewalk, performing exactly the type of service you'd expect from somebody lingering on a sidewalk like this so late at night in a major city. 
She approaches the window, offers her services, and then shows recognition of Sam. It's an instant moment of delight as she realizes why his face is familiar. They share history, some period in time long ago, back from before her journey to the sidewalks and alleyways of Los Angeles. Sam drives around as she recounts her tale, the story of a struggling singer and guitarist with big dreams who came chasing her passion. Like Eric Taylor, she worked odd jobs and didn't quite fit into any of them. And like we saw with Eric Taylor, Sam Deercott has footage of these moments that lets us know he's witnessed the story firsthand. He doesn't need to be told this woman's journey. He recorded it all himself. He was there the entire time. Roughing it in the neighborhoods of LA, she was found by some other street-bound musicians who sympathized, picked her up, and included her in sidewalk performances. They found friends to stay with, vices to indulge in, and eventually, romantic partners with places to call their own. She fell in with a local guy who ended up getting her into the gig she's working now, and she said that while the money was great, it wasn't enough to crush the sense of shame that came with it. Her place in the city was with a guitar, not in a bedroom wearing an outfit made for only one purpose. She didn't want to be that kind of working girl anymore. Her boyfriend wouldn't accept it, and she was thrown out on the street. Sam, of course, had footage of this moment too. At this point, there was only one thing she could do to make money, and it was what she'd been thrown out for refusing. But on her own, facing homelessness once again, she did what she felt was necessary, and that brought her to a meeting with Sam Deercott while working her night shift. And you can all guess what happened from here, although Sam is still nice enough to give us the end of the story in just a few simple bits of footage. And now, for the moment in which this web series finishes fulfilling every last check mark of a major Nightmon case file, and when the good mixes with the bad at their highest points. On October 15th, 2008, Sam Deercon uploaded, This video takes you to hell, and began with a bit of background information to prepare us for what we were about to see. On July 26th, 2008, a group of the human pet viewers began a treasure hunt that would lead them across the country, from Chicago to New York to Los Angeles. Your final destination would require them to dig up something horrible that I had buried, something that revealed a secret from my past and took them literally to hell. This is what they found. My name is Scott. I'm a youth pastor from St. Louis, Missouri. For nearly the last two years, myself and several others have been following the story of one Mr. Sam Deercott, also known as the Code Master. Recently, as we followed his trail, and it showed three locations. There we discovered a flyer for a lost cat and a puzzle, which one of our fellow viewers, Nicole, was able to decipher. A viewer nicknamed Splosion dug up what was buried in the Los Angeles wilderness. What follows are his words and images. We went up to the gap in the fence and found a tree, and there was a pile of dirt which I sifted through and uncovered a box. What to our wondering eyes should appear? Things that give more questions. A silver earring with backing, a leopard pump, with a rosebud in the toe, part of a Polaroid with a woman on it, and a CD, which had a video. And it's here that Sam warns us about the contents of the video, claiming it will take us to hell if we watch it. And in a way, it did, if you were an avid viewer of the Human Pet series when it was running. What follows is supposed to be a video recorded on March 22nd, 1986 by Dr. Henry Reed, a child psychologist in Los Angeles who is on his way to a crime scene. The police have requested his presence to help deal with a child found in the home of a couple who has been murdered. The child has been reported to be more than just traumatized by the death of who seemed to be his parents or caregivers. He's traumatized by the lack of care they actually gave, having been found in a room with a bare mattress, a broken TV set, a litter box, and two dog food bowls. He is suspected as the culprit in the double homicide. The setup here for the doctor and his visit is somewhat believable, but not entirely convincing. It's a very nice touch to have footage of the crime scene with two officers posted who can be seen, adding credibility to the performance. But when Dr. Henry Reed begins to approach the child's bedroom and he hears a voice singing, London Bridge is falling down, so does our power to stay on board with the story being presented by Sam Deercott. 
We walk with Dr. Reed directly into the cliche horror movie situation of the creepy child sitting in a dark room singing a nursery rhyme. Their back turned to us, only to whip around and cause a jump scare as he attacks the doctor at the last second. And it is followed, of course, by evil childish laughter. <sighs> <laughs> this is all capped off by a shot of Sam Deercon in his mask with red text proclaiming, What the world once abandoned has now come back to haunt you. And then it ends. Like that. And there's been no activity from the Human Pet series ever since. It ended on a forced cliche horror situation filled with tropes. And the last one was the laughter of an evil child who was singing nursery rhymes with his back turned in a dark room. <sighs> I don't know what happened. I don't know how we could go from such a meteoric high of getting viewers to actually go outside and dig up trophies from one of Sam's victims to some of the worst cliches you'll ever find in bad indie horror games in a single video. All the way up, the human pet was doing a spectacular job at making things more interesting. Really actually outshining projects I've seen produced in 2017 as far as back as 10 to 11 years ago, when this entire field was new and just gaining experience. I've been impressed by a web series from 2007 more than some of the stuff that I've seen lately, and I've been engaged and inspired, and all of a sudden, right at the end, immediately after making an awesome new milestone, the series just breaks its own neck. I'm not sure this has ever happened with something I've covered before. I can't think of a good example. I've seen a good amount of great things suddenly stop and go cold, or the momentum disappears for a bit, but I've never seen such an immediate crash and burn. This doesn't feel like part of the human pet. The way the quality just took a nosedive, it's almost like I witnessed a murder. It had everything going for it all along. We were about to open an exciting new chapter, and it fell to pieces like that. <sighs> It's sad to say that the human pet really does appear to have died right then and there, too. This truly is a case file in the cell of the Wyoming incident. Older than 10 years, so much going for it back when it was alive, and then the trail goes cold. With the Wyoming incident, there was definite room for a big return, and we actually saw it happen. That game is now technically still active. But this... I don't even know how you could come back from this as a creator. I've enjoyed the ride so much this far that I feel as if I could maybe overlook this moment if Sam Deercon did reappear to pick up his storytelling. I want to know more. I want to experience more shock and awe and horror from his long sordid career of evil. And Eric? Well, I think it's clear now that Eric never actually made it. And as much as Sam wanted us to find out the whole truth of that story, it won't be told now. There's a lot you can say about this project. Most of it is good once you get over the shock of the ending that crashes the series. For something that came out before this field even really took root, this is an awesome achievement and a true undiscovered gem. I just kept seeing things to be impressed about as I went through the history of the human pet, and even with the unnecessary code-breaking side work, this was a great online storytelling experience that really took hold as an alternate reality game at the end. Or was about to, anyhow. We didn't just get to see some maniac online capture a man and torture him for show. We got to witness the humanity of the captive, know his story, know his struggle, spend time with him in a personal space, and then see the dark side that led Sam Deercott to pull him into a cage. Secrets being revealed felt rewarding and made me hungry for more storytelling on the side of both Eric and Sam. And then we find that Sue may have been responsible for the actual murder? That's how you keep rewarding your viewers when it comes to spilling secrets. This is quite an interesting case to study and a bit of a marvel to behold. I wish it had left on a stronger note, but for what it gave, I am grateful. This was a special discovery and quite an effort, especially all the way back during the dawn of YouTube, and I'm glad to have found it. I'm even more grateful that enough of this project was preserved that I could show it to you. That website, findericktaylor.com, was real by the way. The Internet Wayback Machine confirms that. It does have records of the site. Unfortunately, all the links and images are broken, so we don't even really know what it looked like. You've got to applaud that kind of effort though, going to the length of creating so many channels, making a site, establishing a phone number for viewers to call, and the sheer work put into the videos alone. 
If nothing else, Sam Dearcon is quite the video graphics artist for 2006 and 2007, pulling off some techniques we didn't really see put into use for years. And some of his practical editing and setup is to be applauded for sure. A disappointment at the very last second, but a star all the way up to that tragic end. The human pet is certainly one for the records. I think this was the best way to kickstart activity in our new office. But now, it's time to wrap up and head home. The sun will be up soon, and it's best to be in bed before that happens. Thanks to all of you for coming by, and thanks especially to my supporters on Patreon, who made it possible to construct the Nightmind office in the first place. Being able to dedicate the time necessary to learn the appropriate skills, go through the training, and just make this happen at all was only possible because of Patreon support, and I'm extremely grateful. Keep an eye open on your way out to see the names of all these awesome creatures of the night. I do hope you enjoy the memorabilia pieces on the wall here as you leave. I felt that a space for the Nightmind community should have some fun reminders of past investigations, and if you're not familiar with some of these, take a look in the comment section. I'm sure a few viewers will know precisely what all these items are from and which videos will let you experience the associated journeys. And that's it for now, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening, and for meeting me in our new space. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and just like a case of totally unnecessary secret codes, I'll be back again real soon. Sleep tight.